All right, uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm using Zoom, not WebEx this time to record this video, so let's hope it works. What I wanna do in this video is give you guys some hints uh, and tricks on how to solve uh, extensions of Mendelian genetics problems. So like most genetic problems, there are little ways that you can kind of, not game the system, but if you understand how to approach the problem, it becomes much quicker and easier to solve. So to solve these extensions of genetics, of Mendelian genetics problems, such as the one on the left of the screen, um, you can use a little trick that you guys already know or should already know from understanding what a dihybrid cross is. So hopefully you guys all know what a dihybrid cross looks like. Um, I'm using my fancy new tablet bought for this purpose. Um, so a dihybrid cross, as you know, is when you get an organism that is heterozygous for two genes and you cross it to itself, right? So this is a dihybrid cross. And if I was to draw a Punnett square for this cross, I would end up with 16 different boxes, as you guys know. Um, and the ratio of different phenotypes I would see would be, of course, the classic nine, three, three, one ratio of 16. Uh, and there will be 16 different, uh, 16 different possibilities. Nine of them would all look one way. Three would look another way. Three would look another way. And one, of course, would look another way. So if you draw that Punnett square, what you'll see is that the nine that all look the same, have this genotype, where they're dominant A, dominant B, and then something else. This dash could be a dominant or a recessive allele. Um, doesn't matter because there's at least one dominant A and one dominant B. What is there is kind of immaterial, right? So three look like that genetically. The three that look the same are always homozygous recessive for one of those genes and dominant for the other one. The other three is the opposite, so it will be at least one dominant A allele and then two recessive B alleles. And then one, of course, is right in the bottom corner of your Punnett square, and that would look like this. The double the homozygote uh, recessive for the two genes. So. If you look at your Punnett square, you can see that this is how those phenotypic classes break down. And to um, take, it, take a look at a Punnett square, if you would like to do that, to see what I'm talking about. Um, but what you really need to do to answer these extensions of Mendelian genetics problems is essentially commit to memory how these phenotypic classes break down in a dihybrid cross. In other words, you need to be able to write what I just drew a square around in this part. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Cheers, everybody. Um, so, hey, it's, you know, the Armageddon, right? Um, so, uh, keep that in mind as we go through this problem and hopefully we can figure out how to do it together. All right, so this genetics problem like most genetics problems, and you guys are understanding this now, uh, when you look at it, you're, you don't know what the hell's going on, right? Because it's chickens, it's feather color, we don't know what's happening. But let's just read through the problem and see if we can figure out where we can start with it. So in chickens, the leghorn variety has white feathers, okay? And this is due to an autosomal dominant allele. So this tells me that it's due to a dominant <coughs> allele, right? That these guys are white. Uh, so that's going to dominate other um, alleles, right? Because we've been told that it's genetically dominant. Um, a second, so those are leghorn chickens. A second variety, silkies, are also white, but this is due to a recessive allele in a second gene that's different from the gene that causes leghorns to be white. Okay, now we have to be told some assumptions in order for us to solve this problem. Assume that the chickens in the parental generation are homozygous, true breeding, 
for the white allele at one gene and homozygous for the brown allele at the other gene. In subsequent generations, any non-white birds will be brown. And then you ask some questions about um, the phenotypes of different chickens. So the first thing I'm gonna do when I'm trying to figure this out is to define terms for these different genes. So let's look at these two different types of chickens by themselves. First of all, let's look at these leghorn chickens. So we're gonna call the gene that we're interested in in the leghorns W, because it makes them white. Now you are told that a dominant version, so I'll do it as a capital W, causes these to be white. Um, little w, we're going to say, is non-white, which in this case we know is brown, because we're told down here somewhere non-white birds will be brown. So actually, let's just call it brown. Okay, so we'll call it brown. Um, now, the other one, silky, so silky, sorry, I'm writing like a four-year-old. I am not used to this tablet. Um, all right, let's try that again. So silkies, we're told about the silkies. I'm trouble with my case, there you go. Uh, silkies have white feathers because of a recessive, allele in a second different gene. So they are white because they are they have a recessive version of a gene. So um, we'll call this, you know, we'll call this gene B, why not? So recessive versions of this gene would be white. We are told that in the question. And that means that dominant versions of this gene must be brown because we're told non-white birds are brown, right? Okay, so what is this cross? We are told that they're homozygous for the white allele at one gene and homozygous for the brown allele at the other gene. So the leghorns, are white because they have an autosomal dominant allele. So the leghorn is gonna look like this, right? It's gonna have, two, it's gonna be homozygous because we're told that um, in one gene. And the other gene uh, is homozygous for the brown allele. So it must be homozygous for the brown allele, which is the other gene, right? So it must be two capital Bs. So that's a leghorn. Now, what about the silkies? The silkies are gonna be homozygous too, right? And you're told that they're white because they are homozygous recessive. So they must be two little bees. Now you're also told that this gene is dominant, right? So that means silkies have to be homozygous recessive for that particular uh, gene. Okay, so if we cross these two together, what do we get? Well, this should be, you know, becoming clear to you guys the way these problems work, but the cross would obviously give us this individual. So if a true breeding white leghorn is crossed to a true breeding white silky, what is the expected phenotype of the F1 generation? So these are the parents, this is the parental generation, this is the F1. These guys would be, well, they have a capital W, so they would be white um, because that's a dominant gene. So those guys would be white. That was the answer to the first question. If the members of the F1 generation is crossed to each other, what is the expected 
phenotypic outcome of the F2 generation? Well, if I cross this to itself, we have ourselves a dihybrid cross, right? And what I know about a dihybrid cross is that the outcome, as we mentioned earlier, is going to be these phenotypic classes, right? And I said you needed to memorize how those things play out genetically. And the way it's going to play out in this case is, again, nine of them will be at least one capital letter of each. Three of them will look like this. The other three will look like this. And of course, our little one on the end will be this. Now, which, what are these guys going to look like? So, let's figure out the phenotypes of all of these genotypes. Anything that has a capital W is going to be white, because that's a dominant gene. So this guy is white. Let's see, capital W, white. So we only have two left to figure out. This guy at the bottom has no dominant gene, but it is homozygous recessive for the second gene, so that is gonna be white. And actually, we knew this to be true because if you look above at the parental generation, you will see that a silky is actually a double um, a homozygote recessive. Uh, and so finally, what's this guy gonna look like? There's no dominant gene here uh, for, in the W case, so it could be brown. And over here, there's at least one capital B, which means it would be brown. So these chickens would be brown chickens. Now, if you look at what that means from a um, phenotypic ratio, right? What's gonna look the same here? So these guys, these guys, and these guys are all white. And if we add together those phenotypic classes, we see it's nine plus three plus one, it's 13. It's going to be a ratio of 16, right? We know that. So it's 13 to 3. The answer to this question is the phenotypic ratio will be 13 white to 3 brown. And that will be the answer. So remember, when you are doing questions like this, um, what you need to worry about is understanding that with a um, dihybrid cross, you're always going to get the 9331 ratio, and that if there's an epistatic relationship in this 9331 ratio, and again, you can get very quick at drawing this the more times you do it, you're like, oh yeah, I've done this a million times before. You need to understand that when you draw this, right? depending on the relationship between the A and B genes, you're gonna end up combining some of these phenotypic classes to give you different ratios. So I hope that helps. Um, and yeah, give some of those a shot, some of those problems a shot, and um, yeah, let me know if you have problems. All right, best of luck. <laughs>